Welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Hi everybody, I'm Joel Simmons, and today I am live in studio, actually in the office, with my dear friend, our chemist, uh, our uh, mentor, our, our uh, teacher, uh, I don't know what else we call Mr. Lawrence Mayhew. Uh, many of you that have been following us on the podcast for a while have heard Mr. Mayhew. As we have said many times, he is uh, truly a humic acid specialist, but he's a chemist and he's an agronomist and he's a soil scientist. So today we want to, since we're sitting here, we've been spending the day working, uh, going through formulas and, and trying to tweak things. But let's talk a little bit about basic fertility, <clears throat> and um, and I know that's a big subject. But and we've we've talked specifically about humic acids. We've talked about a lot of things. Uh, but let's go through some basic basic uh, concepts on on N, P, and K. Uh, I have a load of laundry list here. I've added calcium, which we could probably start with. I've added magnesium, uh, which we call the photosynthesis element. And then I think we should certainly talk about sodium and its impact primarily on our concept of biological soil management. So the conversation should be kind of directed around um, what is the impact and, 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 and the why of what that impact is when we're talking about soil biology. So um, I asked you, I think I asked you this morning, so what will we talk about? And your answer was, let's talk about life. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so not a bad place to start. And then it kind of quickly evolved to calcium. So, I mean, let's talk about life. I mean, obviously everything that we do ultimately impacts life in the soil. And, and one of the things that you and I have worked on uh, diligently over the last uh, uh, number of months and certainly today is eco-adaptive chemistries, which are going to help the life of the soil. So by not using uh, caustic materials in our fertility programs uh, by balancing out ke uh, the chemistry within the fertility program uh, here at Earthworks at least and, and the work that you're helping me with is to create a situation where we have uh, a balance and where we have eco-adaptivity which means we're going to support biological life. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. All right so we, we have some idea and, and uh, we can go from there. Let's talk about calcium. Give us your dissertation doctor of uh, <laughs> of what calcium is all about, what's the importance, formulas, um, uh, formate, you, know, uh, um, you know, kind of the materials that we should be using. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, is things like, is gypsum uh, a really a soluble material or is it not soluble? Nope. Talk about in broad spectrums, what's the importance of calcium and, uh, and you know, how can, how can we make it better in, in what we're doing out there in the field? I had the uh, good fortune to be trained by Gary Zimmer who literally wrote the books on biological farming. And Gary Zimmer likes to say calcium is the trucker of all minerals. From a scientific perspective, what he's actually saying is that other nutrients become more bioavailable in soil systems with microbes if calcium, a bioavailable form of calcium, is present. So now I need to qualify what bioavailable calcium is. Yes, do that. Because the emphasis on calcium is always solubility. Well, the emphasis on NPK is solubility in conventional agriculture. Uh, that has failed us miserably. Uh, that's what brings on uh, destroying soil life. That's what brings on Im imbalances in what, we, what a chemist would call stoichiometry, which means that you've got the, lim the new limiting factor is now too much of something. And if you put on too much of anything, that's the new limiting factor, in my opinion. Explain that. Well, I was trained that the limiting factor from the old uh, Liebig, you know, yeah. the, the chemist or of Liebig. Or Liebig. Or yeah. Big Lie, depending on how Some you say potato. So, right. so uh, <laughs> Von Liebig is the way I pronounce it because I live in the woods and no one's there to correct me. Probably good. Yeah. And uh, I, I checked his book out of the University of Wisconsin uh, Central Library when I first started studying soil biology. 1843 book, if I recall, and I'm walking down the street with this thing in my hand. I go, wow, <laughs> you, can, you can go in there and, and take this home with you. And I did, and I read it. And essentially what I got out of that book was that if you can 
dissolve a chemical in water solution and put it in the soil system, that's, that, be, that became the basis of fertilization. Explain, so everybody understands the Liebig theory. Oh. Or, or the, uh, I'm, I'm obviously pronouncing that wrong. But Liebig, Liebig. Liebig, Liebig. <laughs> explain the uh, Liebig theory, and, and it, it has to do with the water barrel and the limiting factors. Yeah, right? Eustace von Liebig said that the limiting factor in any soil or agricultural system would be the, uh, the nutrient that is in least abundance and maybe deficiency, and that nutrient would be considered the limiting factor. So theoretically, <clears throat> and so if, if calcium is the limiting factor, it pulls mm -hmm. down everything else. So until mm -hmm. the calcium level uh, rises to the top of the barrel, all the water falls out of the barrel because calcium is that limiting factor, that deficiency. So theoretically, then the focus would be on that limiting factor, getting that into the soil first, getting calcium or whatever that could be anything as a limiting factor. When I went off on my own as an independent consultant, having been trained about soluble calcium sources, first thing I did was I developed a highly soluble calcium product, and I thought I would go out and sell it. And I, I went up to a uh, farmer's meeting in northern Wisconsin, and I have my graphs up on the screen, and, you know, like, here's calcium carbonate, here's calcium sulfate, and here's my product. Oh, you know, the stuff up off there. the chart. Isn't that wonderful? And I'm standing in front of the audience, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what, what have I gone and done? <laughs> I, I've just violated one of my own rules. In my opinion, if you overdo something, that's the new limiting factor. And here I was promoting highly soluble calcium and put on more and more and more. And I just stood there, and I felt so foolish. I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm totally overlooking my chemistry training, my chemistry training says everything has to be in balance. And the word balance in agriculture is a totally different word than if you're a formally trained chemist. When you're a formally trained chemist, you don't say I need X number of pounds of calcium and X number of pounds of phosphorus. No, you look at what's called molecular weight of these materials and then you, you apply these materials as molar quantities. I'll give you an example. If you had a pound of lead sitting in front of you right now, it'd be a certain size, right? Would, oh, yeah, it weighs about a pound. If you had a pound of feathers, it's not the same. The number of molecules in a pound of feathers is so much more than the number of molecules. The box would be bigger. The, the box would be bigger, yeah. you know. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize that what you're really looking at is the density of these materials right. are, are different. The density of calcium, the density of phosphorus, the density of magnesium, potassium, they're all <laughs> different. So for a chemist, a chemist looks at formulating products or putting a uh, product on a soil in terms of molar values how many moles of this do we have so let's let's talk specifically about calcium and and, yeah. and practical terms for uh, a grass grower or anybody growing any plant material mm -hmm. let's start real basically what's the importance of calcium to plant material the calcium is what gary zimmer called the trucker of all minerals meaning that calcium improves the uptake of other minerals and mm -hmm. other nutrients. The, the chemistry behind that is very solid. The, the history behind that statement is, is solid. It's been well proven. So the mistake I made was trying to develop a product that had way too much calcium in it, which sounds kind of silly. You, you know, you want more soluble this, more soluble that. So at that time, I began to realize that it was really all about balance rather than about absolute solubility and pounds. And again, you're talking balance. Up. Chemically, you're not... Chemical it, balance. This is not some, hyp, you know, some hypothetical... Um, Molecular balance. You know, one of the things that I... When I talk about calcium, I always use the simple <clears throat> analogy is if this room was a cell, these walls are calcium pectate. And the stronger <clears throat> the walls are, the less likely, as an example, a pathogen could poke their way through. Yes. So I go from balsa wood with thin walls to cinder blocks with thick walls because I have more calcium coming into the plant. Cell walls are stronger. Plant is stronger. Turgidity. you got stability. Uh, plant can stand up, uh, you know, fight wind, fight mowing, uh, all those things. And these are mm -hmm. all fair statements when we talk of calcium. 
Yeah, uh, calcium shuts down the uh, the enzymes that attack cells. These enzymes are actually uh, in various uh, parasites, bacteria, and so forth. Anything that wants to attack a cell wall has to make the, make it through the pectin, which is a calcium-based right. material. And if there's bioavailable calcium floating around inside the cell itself, it shuts down those proteolytic and those other lytic enzymes. So let's talk mm -hmm. calcium specifically. A okay. lot of, a uh, couple silly questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Is calcium going to move through uh, the, the plant and, and can it essentially become uh, a um, foliar fed material? Can you actually truly have a foliar fed calcium product? I, I believe that because uh, a calcium chloride is not a good foliar. A calcium carbonate is not soluble. A calcium sulfate has very low solubility, but sulfates actually antagonize the movement of anything across the cell walls on leaf surfaces. But these are typically what have been used, yeah. <laughs> sulfates, chlorides, but they antagonize the uptake of nutrients, especially potassium. So I've been studying the acetates quite extensively lately and incorporating them into formulations as part of the formula, but not relying entirely upon them. In other words, we don't make a calcium acetate. Right. You know, we make a calcium with three, four other calciums in there and acetate being one of them. So that it can get into, some of it can be taken up. But most of it, quite honestly, when we're spraying a couple gallons of water, especially on a grass plant that's been cut at a quarter of an inch, is not most of that, if not all of that, calcium are actually being drawn in through the root system? Overwhelming majority yeah. of it. How mm. about calcium nitrate? Is it a good calcium source as a calcium product? It sucks. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> okay, it's 24% it's calcium and over 76% nitrate. So it's a nitrate. It's not a calcium product. Yeah. So when using calcium nitrate uh, to to get calcium in there, you're really, uh, are you getting any calcium in at all? No, because the nitrate's going to inhibit the calcium uptake. And the balance, the chemical balance is kind of, of whacked out. Yeah, calcium nitrate is not a yeah. molecularly balanced or ecologically balanced or it, it's, it's not stoichiometry. Its stoichiometry is totally contrary to what we find in soil solution. Explain stoichiometry. Most Sto of us don't understand. These oh, okay. Terms. H2O. Start there. All right. Water. <laughs> okay. If you have two atoms of uh, hydrogen, you can combine them with one atom of oxygen. Okay. Okay. What gets overlooked is that two atoms of hydrogen only weigh two molecular weights. <laughs> the oxygen that's in there weighs 16, so you, you, you have a big mass difference in the two and if you said so again you, it's balance yeah it, it's balance okay. it's stoichiometry balance that's h2o if you had h3o you wouldn't have, you water, wouldn't have anymore. water anymore if you had h1o or ho3 you don't have water anymore let's so. talk calcium specifically <clears throat> in soil uh, we tend to use calcium carbonates uh, mm -hmm. we tend to use uh, gypsum uh, there is a big difference between dolomitic lime and high calcium or calcitic lime. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why calcium in a soil? I mean, and, and you know, uh, we were taught, I was, uh, you know, a county agent for a lot of years. You know, I went through the university system. I was taught that this is really nothing more than a pH buffer. Talk about calcium's importance in the soil structure. When to use it, when don't you use it, uh, and what form do you use based on, on what parameters that the soil test might tell us. Could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm not writing this down. Um, Let's start with limestone. I mean, yeah, limestone is calcium carbonate rock. It's a right. rock, okay? And it can be um, something that's absolutely insoluble in soil systems unless the pH is real low, i.e. if you have an acid soil, then that rock will dissolve. So the, the interesting thing about that is that being dissolved by an acid does not make that calcium bioavailable. It, the calcium is now seeking usually a phosphate to lock onto or something else. An anion else. so that the cation can hold on. It's got to be balanced. It's right. got to be neutralized. There you go balancing. It, it, it's going to seek out something in that soil solution to, to actually become electronically balanced because yeah. it's got a two negative two positive charge on it and uh, phosphates are notorious for combining with calcium it's called yeah. apatite it's the original ore that uh, 
that's in phosphate ores. And it's just found in all systems. But in a soil system that's actually dominated by microbial activity, they will convert calcium to calcite. Gotcha. It's a biogenic calcium, and those would be the preferred forms of calcium right there. A biogenic calcium, a calcium which is... What's a biogenic calcium? It's generated by microbes. It's generated by microorganisms. What's an example? Calcite. Calcite. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. It's universal in all, in all uh, soil systems. Calcite is the naturally occurring calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate has like 600 different crystalline forms. So yeah. this is one of them. Limestone is one of them, but it's a rock. And calcite isn't. Calcite is a crystalline form that's bioavailable. can be broken down by microbes. can be utilized by root systems. It's, uh, it's what if, what naturally the, there. What if the soil isn't biologically active? It's a fairly dead soil, a sand-based soil, or a soil that's just not been bio, uh, bio charged then you don't want to drink the water near that <laughs> <laughs> of <course not. laughs> because those sort of conditions are always hydroponically approached gotcha. pour more on because they're passing past the plant root they call that diffusion i don't believe in mass flow diffusion diffusion all those other things because you can just use mycorrhizae as an example that totally disagrees with those that. models yeah. yeah yeah those models do not fit biological Right, agriculture. So it's not it's not exactly the same thing. No. Let's talk about what is the difference between dolomitic lime and calcitic percent magnesium. Uh, in Wisconsin, where I come from, my house sits on dolomitic limestone. Mm -hmm. My soils around my place are high in magnesium and calcium and carbonate, but you don't want to put more of that on to right. correct for acidity because you're adding. Uh, additional magnesium to the soil so we do see magnesium and calcium imbalances where I live stone or what my clients use as a calcite it's mined up in Michigan from calcite Michigan and we can source it out of Green Bay and if you're adding I mean magnesium can add to the pH and push the pH up as fast as calcium can right? that's what you keep telling me yeah and I see it on soil <laughs> tests all the time okay although I get criticized all the time so what do I know well no anyway? wonder <laughs> uh, gypsum what is it gypsum is uh, calcium net anhydrous anhydrous <clears throat> calcium sulfate is called anhydrite just a nickname uh, neither one are highly soluble in water so something has to cause calcium sulfate to break down and that that's generally done through uh, microbial activity again but it's got an extremely high content of sulfate much much higher than are than are found in natural soil systems so i just because of the, again the stoichiometry the balance of yeah that, of that uh, soil. you go look for sulfate <clears throat> in a natural soil you're not going to find it it's yeah. just not there so we go and pour on sulfates. Why? <laughs> I mean, they're very disruptive, extremely disruptive. Explain that. How is a sulfate disruptive to the soil system? It, it impacts the, the molecular structure of water, just for starters, which means that you're going to have to use more water wherever you're using sulfates. It pulls the thermodynamics of that soil system are always looking for the shortcut way. In other words, they always say nature... How's that saying go? Nature works... In mysterious ways? Yeah, forget it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it takes so much energy out of the soil yeah. system in, in order for that sulfate to be absorbed into energetically into that system that they have to be they have to be equalized in some way or another. And it's just it's, it's just the same old story. They they go into natural balance. Sulfates generally combine with organic matter in, in soil systems. They're they're never found all by themselves. You'd have to go to the edge of a volcano to find sulfates. Sulfates, naturally. Yeah, yeah. natural sulfates. So calcium is important both to the plant, both to the soil, but it's also important to the microbial population. Very much so. They need yeah. calcium in their bodies just like you and I need it to build soil, to build bone structure bones but no but uh, they need it for their nutrition right so to so, improve their, the efficiency of their nutrition right so when we're talking nutrition to a plant we're really talking soil nutrition plant nutrition microbial nutrition and that goes back mm -hmm. to where we started this conversation is <laughs> let's talk about life and, oh, yeah. and in this case the life <laughs> is the life of the soil you keep using bioavailable which means right all of these minerals, and again, calcium probably one of the best examples. It's a mineral. It's a rock. It doesn't move very fast. But what moves it better than anything? Soil biology. 
Yes. So we just keep feeding soil biology. You and I did a podcast not long ago talking about carbon and the balance of carbon in that carbon pyramid. Uh, and it's all about keeping that biological activity. And when we have that biological activity, we increase mobility and then we can use less. And, and mm -hmm. uh, as you started this, there's a big uh, conversation in the turf industry about using less. And it's, a, it's, it's truly a wonderful conversation and less is, is definitely better. We've been preaching less. Um, you know, I've certainly been hearing about it since the day I met Jerry Bernetti and Earthworks has been teaching less since the very beginning, but we're talking about the right kind of less, which means biology drives the reduction of inputs as opposed to simply just taking, you know, half your lunch away or, or filling your tank up with, you know, half as much gas and hoping that the car makes it, uh, you know, for the same mm -hmm. distance. So biology, life, the beginning of this conversation really uh, kind of drives that home. And that's all about feeding microbes and, and getting available carbon. So uh, I'm rambling and this is your show. Let's talk about, uh, <laughs> let's talk about potassium. I'm going to go down this little laundry list that I wrote on this piece mm -hmm. of paper here. So uh, potassium, lots of sources. We use a lot of different sources. Uh, let's talk again about the importance of potassium to plants, to soil, and to biology. I think potassium is extremely important to water utilization. It, that's a big one. Uh, in turf, uh, you, you, you talk about how rigid the plant is and you're looking for better ball roll and that sort of thing. Well, that just shows that the, the water is being retained in the cells and and, and the uh, grass is stiff, let's call it that. Yeah. Well, that's one thing. The other thing is that potassium is extremely critical to the health of the plant. But if you apply p potassium in a turf sit setting, you're not going to see green up. You know? So potassium is kind of a hard sell in a, in a sense. Uh, it, it will actually be very, very critical to the vigor and the health of the plant. Potassium is involved in a lot of different enzymatic processes. The problem with potassium fertilizers is they don't work. I, I don't know how they work. I, I can't figure out how they could possibly work because they're always chlorides, sulfates, something like that, and it's just very difficult for the plant to absorb them across their membranes. So we take a little different approach, of course. You know, we, we look at what can be absorbed. Potassium is one of the most difficult ones to absorb. And again, we're, we're looking at acetates and a combination of acetates, carbonates, uh, just a dash of sulfate <laughs> in the formulas uh, be, to actually achieve potassium utilization by the plant. What about mineral forms of potassium? Rock forms? You mean like the chlorides? No, or? not. I'm, we don't. I'm. I, what do I always say about potassium chloride? It's chlorine at a rate ten times higher than we use to chlorinate water. Yeah. And why do we chlorinate water? To kill life. And since yeah. <laughs> this is a conversation about life, as we started this, uh, the last thing we want to do is talk about killing the life in the well, soil. Well, the most highly used potassium fertilizer is potassium chloride, and chloride inhibits the uptake of potassium. There oh, you go. Oh, great. <laughs> kind of silly. Who thought uh, of that one? Can a soil buffer? Uh, small amounts of potassium, a, a good healthy soil, can it buffer small amounts of potassium chloride? Small, really okay. low, low inputs. Potassium is the weirdest material I get to work with. If something gels up or plugs up, you can almost point your fingers to potassium yeah. almost every time. And because <clears throat> potassium is so highly reactive, it's a, it's a very small atom with a positive charge on it, and it, and it seeks equilibrium and finds it in soils by actually becoming part of the mineral structure of soils. It does not absorb on the colloids. It does not become uh, associated with organic matter. There's a negative correlation between the amount of organic matter and, and available calcium, I'm sorry, potassium in a soil. It becomes part of the soil mineral structures. It, the, all the minerals that are in there have certain openings where they can bring in potassium and exchange it for aluminum or something else. And that's where they end up. We call it tied up. Yeah. Okay, again, there's only one way to get them out of there. <laughs> We talked a lot. We've been talking a lot all day about relationships. Can you say it? It's microbes. It's, <laughs> it's all about life. It's all about it's life. life. Yeah, life. It's all about life. Life can extract it. Nothing uh, else. Nothing I, else does. I talk a lot about. Uh, I mean, one of the big issues that we talk about <clears throat> in turf is sodium and, and the influx of sodium into the plant, mm -hmm. and having an adequate level of potassium and a higher percentage of potassium on the soil colloid over sodium allows that potassium to kind of keep sodium at bay. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between sodium and potassium is real. 
Is that yep. a fair statement? Yeah, they're synergistic up to a point, and then they yeah. antagonize each other. <laughs> so if we have high sodium, keeping potassium levels uh, as, antagonizes as, as strong potassium. and antagonizes that. And we'll come back to sodium. And vice versa. Yeah. Um, let's talk about one of my favorite elements, the energy molecule, phosphorus. Mm. Um, it's gotten a lot of really bad press, uh, maybe some politics. Uh, I mean, we, we're working in multiple states now that they've actually banned uh, applications of phosphorus. And, uh, and, and, and one of the things I've seen over the years of phosphorus bans is that it's, it goes along uh, for quite a while, and then literally everything falls off the table, and we start to see a breakdown. We start to see plant breakdown. We see weed infestation. We see all sorts of things because now the soil has been so depleted of a mineral that is barely mobile to start with. And I'm, and again, I'm, I, I say this uh, uh, with with great uh, conscience because I, I am very aware of uh, the potential of potassium. Uh, pollution in waterways and and the, and the impacts that it can have and it's very real we all know that we appreciate that but in soils especially in a cover crop soil like turf uh, what's the damage of these overuses of phosphorus are they going to tie up completely i mean i find more uh more problems of having phosphorus not available than having it you know being worried once it's in the soil um, it's not going anywhere is that a fair statement yeah, it usually combines with calcium, and, and calcium is bound to organic matter, direct correlation between organic matter and bioavailable calcium. So the phosphorus is there, so biological activity can release the phosphorus. Right. And it's, uh, it's, again, it's like sulfates, which are highly reactive chemicals. Phosphates are even more reactive chemicals in soil systems. They need to be stabilized, otherwise they leach out. And over applying them really doesn't help. It just right. you just put more in the Mississippi Delta instead. And they've been they are the a lot of people say nitrogen is the most over applied thing. Well, I don't know how you would tell the difference between over applying nitrogen, over applying phosphorus. It's just been way, way, way over applied. So it, again, we're going to use that biology word again, yeah. and we have to rely on that. We have to build organic matter in order to make phosphorus bioavailable. There's there's hardly any, if any, soluble phosphate in a soil system. It's, it's almost non-existent. And I've done the calculations on it, and it comes out like something like 0 0.00001 pound per Pretty acre. Yeah. And it's not there. It's, yeah. it's, it's combined with organic matter and calcium primarily. And the way you release them is, is re, rebalance the system and, and rely on biology and organic matter, which is directly related to how much biological activity there is, in order to get phosphorus. Yeah. It's an organic form. It's not phosphate yeah. and up into a plant. Talk about the importance of phosphorus in the plant. <clears throat> I, I call it the energy molecule. Uh, I mm -hmm. think Jerry uh, Bernetti uh, you know, instilled in my brain early on is that uh, phosphorus is called upon by the plant anytime the plant's under stress. So the heat of the summer, uh, drought stress, um, chemical imbalance within the soil, all of these, the plant has that intelligence to say, you know what, I need a little bit more energy to get this thing going. So mm -hmm. it, it starts going out and trying to hunt down phosphorus or pull it into the plant by spitting out organic acids and, and, and dissolving some phosphorus or breaking it free or encouraging biology in the soil to break it free. Uh, what's the importance to the plant of this element? Energy. Energy transfer systems uh, through a uh, chemical in, in the plant's physiology, in their in their physiology, we'll settle for that, uh, called adenosine triphosphate and that's also called ATP. Uh, but it doesn't take very much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these are minuscule amounts of phosphorus. You're talking about involved. the Krebs cycle. and, uh, and, and All those cycles, and neither yeah. one of us can remember yeah, anymore. Exactly. Yeah. That's the only one I remember. It Boy, I Jeopardy nailed once. it at the time, but I don't remember <laughs> it. <laughs> ATP is energy. I mean, ATP, it's, ADP. It's the energy transfer in plants, yeah. and uh, it's a system that's constantly cycling in plants, and phosphorus is not... Um, burned up it, it doesn't disappear in the plant it's reutilized recycled over and over and over again in these cycles that you just mentioned so that's the beauty of it uh let's say a, a, a high energy 
forage in Wisconsin, which is basically an alfalfa forage, would have 0.43% phosphorus in it. To be specific. Yeah. I mean, that's not a lot. No, <laughs> so, that's not a lot. No. So you don't need a lot to make to drive that system. Yeah. The new limiting factor. You, know, you put on yeah. too much phosphorus, and then it gets tied up and pulls calcium out of the right. soil, and you need that. And, so, yes, we can yeah. overdo and overapply, but yeah. having a biological easy. system. Very, it's easy, very easy. One of the things we've talked a lot about uh, on the podcast and at mm -hmm. Earthworks, and you and I have talked a lot about, is one of the best ways to get phosphorus into the plant is clearly soil biology, and one of the best ways to do that is mycorrhizae. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was talking about diffusion and mass flow yeah. and all those before. Um, yeah, mycorrhizae just blows that away. Mycorrhizae connects so intimately <laughs> with plant roots that if you dig up a plant root and there's mycorrhizae present, you cannot tell the difference between the two. The root and the mycorrhizae It's an extension yeah. of that root system. And That's what it means in Latin is root extension. And... It does a beautiful job of reaching out, pulling in more than just phosphorus, pulling in micronutrients and all sorts of nutrients. Phosphorus is a big one because there's so little of phosphorus in natural systems that nature has adapted to that by creating mycorrhizae. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And, and mycorrhizae does a number of things, obviously. It's, it's, it's actually creating this... Uh, material called glomalin, yeah. uh, which is kind of like a natural wetting uh, agent. It, it keeps the soil uh, friable. It keeps it, uh, um, you know, moist so that it can move water around it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like you said, it's it's out there not only finding nutrients like phosphorus, but it's also pulling in water. Yeah, gluing the colloids the color together. together. Uh, how do you glue something together and retain uh, high water, <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> what happens when we have an active mycorrhizal fungal uh, population and we apply uh, synthetic forms of phosphorus? Shuts them soil? down. Why and how? Because uh, the plant is sensing that it has an abundant supply of phosphorus and the plant will not send out exudates to feed the mycorrhizae so the mycorrhizae just have nothing to eat <laughs> so they just stop working they yeah just, the they, mycorrhizae need to be associated with the roots they, they don't live on their own yeah it's it's a, it's a symbiosis very popular in turf <laughs> management is using a lot of phosphorus as starter fertilizer to get the plant you know to get the grass plants growing uh, so it's very common that we put out a lot of uh, monomonium phosphate or, or diammonium phosphate to to get a starter position can we do that same thing by using a mycorrhizal based material no <laughs> <laughs> wrong answer <laughs> uh, the way we've approached it for quite a few years agriculturally is get everything in balance as much as possible, yeah. incorporate cover crops, which you can't do. Uh, well, we are a cover crop in turf. Yeah, There's you're an eternal cover, cover crop, yeah, so maybe you've got a huge advantage over yeah. agriculture. There is there is a lot of to say about that. And, you know, there is. not only that, that it also holds nutrients in the soil and keeps, you know, keeps everything from the surface from just rolling down into the stream. Yeah, I don't want Fosses. to give the impression put on zero foss. I exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, being a product developer, I, I can't develop a product that has absolutely 0 0.00 FOSS. Yeah, especially just, using organic based yeah, materials. Yeah, uh, any, using any yeah. fish or anything like Kelp that, you, anything, yeah. you're not going to achieve 0 0.00. It's not going to happen. Yeah, but we can keep it down to a, a kind of a minimum. Which but is... the miraculous thing about that is I've developed a database of what I think is in soil solution based on a tremendous amount of data that my wife and I put together over the last seven years. And when I, when I enter my formulations and I've analyzed everything for like 23 different elements, phosphorus shows up as being sufficient. And I'm going, really? You know, this is kind of cool. Yeah. You know, so yeah, if if you're working with the right kind of products, so a biologically oriented product, you're going to get sufficient phosphorus, so you won't be overdoing it. And yeah, if the mycorrhizae are there, they will sense that this phosphorus isn't going to impede their growth because it impedes the exudates that are put up by plant roots. We see by looking at, you know, we're looking at 15,000 soil tests a year, and, and many wow. of those are water-soluble tests. Mm -hmm. We often can see on the soil, a standard soil test, a colloidal test, very high levels of phosphorus. 
Always. And then when we yeah. flip that over to the water soluble test, we can literally see <clears throat> less than signs indicating theoretically that there's virtually no phosphorus mobilizing. How do we explain that to a client? <laughs> well, <laughs> how do you explain I that? I think I them? just did. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it, it's, it's, it's been a mistake to think that we need humongous amounts of phosphorus yeah. in soils. And then you run a PACE test, and your taste test only confirms what I just said. It's not it, mobile. No, it, it's not mobile. It, it's going to be tied up with something, which is normal. Yeah. You know, this isn't a problem. You know, you can't solve the problem by putting on more phosphate. That's not, that's not the so solution. If it was, we wouldn't be polluting the globe. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the moron theory. And... You need to understand be, that... That being more on the ground, not yes, the moron yes, theory. Yes, I understand. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> we don't want to insult anybody. Especially you. Exactly. So that's why I'm saying, that's why I'm so sensitive to this. Uh, I, just, I just keep pounding on this drum, don't I? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to put on a lot of inputs. How do you sell that? You don't have to put a lot on. How do you sell low guarantees on tag yeah. fertilizer labels? It, we're, we've been all educated that we had to put more and more and more on. Now, the alfalfa in Wisconsin is a classic example. They go out there and they, they pull alfalfa and then they run a tissue test and the lab report comes back next week. You're low on potassium. So what do they do? Put on more potassium chloride usually. No. And it's never worked. Then if you can run what's called a PT2 analysis of these soils, which is a very strong extraction process, it'll pull... 90% of the mineral out during during the laboratory uh, extraction process. There's 30 to 40,000 pounds of potassium per it's acre there. in Wisconsin. Yeah, it's just not and much. they can't take it up. And yeah. they think the solution is to put more on. Sorry, it's not how it which works. Which then, again, continues to push back the biology, which makes the mobility even worse. So we're just... <laughs> You know, back, so again, back on you the know, treadmill. You keep talking about and then, using then less. And then low potassium uptake leads to more disease, so right. then you bring out the IDEs, the IDEs, you know, and it's like, oh, my gosh. It's so, you know, again, woo. it goes back to the conversation, life. Uh, you know, yeah. And if we can get biology to do all of our heavy lifting, the only way we're going to truly be able to reduce inputs and use minimal amounts of inputs is to improve life in the soil, which is really what biological soil management is all about. Which Somehow is we need to our... educate, and <clears throat> organic growers already got this figured out. Somehow we need to educate the masses that you do not need to put huge quantities on to get a result. What you need is something that's in balance. If you want to read a really good book, read Ecological Stoichiometry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay. Just, <laughs> just not. I like. Yeah. Unless I really am insomniac, I'll, I'll do that. But yeah, Na sounds very insane. Nature very... has figured out the chemistry yeah. of soil systems, and there is a yeah. stoichiometry to these soil systems, and it is yeah. ecologically sound. But we don't practice that. I'll wait for the movie. How's that? <laughs> All right, I'm going to jump over one, and let's go right to magnesium. Meg, what yeah. do we say when we talk about magnesium? Uh, I mean, it's the photosynthesis element is what I like to talk about. What what's the importance of magnesium to the plant, to the microbes, to the soil? Uh, how do we best get it in? Uh, how mobile is it? What's the I hate to use this word stoichiometry because I can't even pronounce it. Talk about magnesium. Magnesium works best in the presence of balance with calcium. The the two work together. You look on a periodic table, calcium's here, magnesium's underneath this, so that tells the chemist that these things interchange readily. So you don't want to put a lot of magnesium on to create a, a to correct for magnesium. And you don't want to put too much calcium. You want to put on just a nice balance of calcium and magnesium. You want to put on the same balance that shows up in natural systems. And what's that balance? Do we know? Yeah, I can do it on paper, but okay. <laughs> it, it's 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 essentially a little more calcium than than magnesium, and then then you get a great exchange and uptake of magnesium. Then you see an increase in photosynthesis. I don't think I have to preach to the choir here and say that it is the central atom of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll. But it is. Yeah. It has to get into the plant, and if if uh, it, we need that for photosynthesis, if the amount of photosynthesis starts dropping in a plant, it's going to get sick. And it's not going to produce, and you're going to have to put on more ides in order to correct for the problems yeah. that everything's attacking it now. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 
it's all balance, and, and that balance just needs redefining. What happens in the soil when we have too much magnesium? First thing you kind of notice is that it, it, uh, it in increases the compaction of soils. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I live up in Wisconsin on dolomitic soils, and boy, our, our, some, most of our soils where I live are like cement. I mean, it, it, by the middle of summer, you can't even drive anything into when them. When it dries out, when the moisture goes down. Yeah. One it, of the things I always say about magnesium is you can always tell a high mag soil by walking on it. If yeah. it sticks to your boot, uh, you know, and you got this extra, you know, layer of, of, uh, of uh, sole on your boot, you've got a high magnesium soil. It's very sticky. Mm -hmm. It's adobe bricks. So mm -hmm. like you said, I mean, try to run a probe through a dry, high magnesium soil, and it's almost impossible to do. Yep, and uh, soil, the conventionally farmed soils up by me are highly compacted and they have high amounts of magnesium. They've been told all these years to put on you know, high dolomitic limestone by the University of yeah. Wisconsin. By, yeah, the, yeah, so, the yeah, USDA yeah. was doing that They know what they're doing, years. So, and we don't. Yeah. And uh, anybody who is looking to try to increase their balance of calcium against magnesium Usually we'll work with something like a limestone kiln dust or something like that. Just to get it to, available. Which has no magnesium yeah. in it whatsoever. High calcium lime. Yeah, like high cal yeah. limes are used if you have a pH imbalance. We've seen if there's a calcium deficiency and a magnesium excess, high calcium lime can actually be a pretty effective way to kind of push off some of the magnesium and allow some, and I've gotten into so much trouble saying this, and I'll probably get into trouble by saying it here. But, you know, I've done it thousands of times, you know, Jerry Brunetti, Bill McKibben, uh, you know, everybody we've worked with, you know, they have seen the, in high CEC soils, not in low CEC soils, but in high clay-based soils, uh, when there's an excess of magnesium and a deficiency of calcium, applying um, uh, some high calcium lime, low mag lime, mm -hmm. can actually push some of that magnesium out and maybe even bring some hydrogen in, which can actually allow, and here's where I get in trouble, pH to start to drop a little bit. Uh, because it's simply exchanging one for another, but it only works in high CEC soils, clay-based soils. On on sand-based greens and teas and sports fields in our industry, uh, that's a model that just we don't follow. We just try to keep calcium magnesium uh, as, as soluble as we possibly can. What is the, other than photosynthesis, what else does magnesium do uh, to the plant, for the plant? It's involved, again, in a lot of... Uh excuse me, in, in a lot of enzy enzymatic reactions. Yeah. Very, very critical of that. And that we could spend a whole day on is talking about what these uh, physiological functions are within the plant. And actually, that was one of my favorite classes at college was, and maybe the one I, I didn't fall asleep through, but uh, <laughs> phys plant physiology uh, when I was at school was fascinating because of all the interactions in particular of some of these um, uh, you know, macro elements and some of these secondary elements like magnesium and calcium. But those relationships in building enzymatic activity, which then become spark plugs for all these other uh, functions in the, in the plant, uh, are, are incredibly important. So having magnesium, having calcium uh, available in, in the soil so the plant can bring it up, uh, it's going to keep the plant healthier and, and it's going to help guys get through the summer a lot easier when, when the stress times are really on. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about sodium and then we can end up by talking about our favorite uh, uh, guy that we'll talk about later, but sodium uh, is sodium important to the plant? Does plant need to take sodium up? Yeah, it's essential. It's an essential. I mean, element we've been told the plants. whole time that you know, no, you don't want sodium. Sodium bad. Sodium bad. But sodium uh, really isn't completely the, bad. The it's Im just when it's too much. When the imbalance of sodium occurs, go. then we do have problems, right? Yeah. So we're constantly trying to, you know, in in and and typically in in our, the turf world, sodium is coming to the soil profile because it's excessive in the water. Well, system. here's what happens as a product developer: if I put if I balance sodium in in the products, and then someone comes along and uses a, a, like a sodium carbonate or bicarbonate yeah. laden water, uh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so so I just get rid of the sodium as much as I possibly can in the product because I know that people are going to be applying it. It's in inadvertently. The water. It's, yeah, exactly. You can't, I mean, can't you, help you can't it. help it. Exactly. It's so common. What is in seawater? Yeah, exactly. That tells you everything right there. The most common two elements that we have flowing down all our rivers and our wells and everything else is sodium chloride. Yeah. 
and between chlorides and sodiums, I try to avoid them in a product because they are inevitably going to be there. So when we, you know, one of the things, and I've said this many, many, many times on the podcast and in lectures, is that one of the most limiting factors in growing quality turf or quality landscape plants in general is if there's too much sodium yeah. typically coming from water. See, limiting factor, too limiting much factors. sodium. <laughs> yeah. so, Not, too much, too much. <laughs> biology. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Um, soil biology. Increase, you know, good, healthy uh, carbon-rich soils will help to sequester sodium? Uh, organic matter is an indicator that you have good uh, biological activity. And organic matter is very capable of neutralizing and balancing imbalances such as sodium and, and capturing it and allowing other exchanges to occur on the colloids. And uh, that it, it's, it's like magic. It, it, it's almost like a universal answer to everything. Right. <laughs> you know, if, if, if you want, if you're having trouble with this or that or this or that or this, okay, build your organic matter, and there's only one way to do that. Yeah. Biological activity. It goes back to life. That's the only place it comes from. Let's get life in that soil. That, now, that's carbon, but those are extremely complex yeah. carbons that are associated with incredibly complex molecules, not just simple carbon. All right. Since we had on, that lecture already. Since we have, we have. <laughs> Since we're on the bandwagon, let's uh, Ooh, let's cool. talk about our friend nitrogen. And in turf, oh, nitrogen yeah. is king. Uh, everything is driven by nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as we know, uh, we can overdo nitrogen. Um, and we talk a lot about the carbon to nitrogen ratio and how that becomes imbalanced. There's your word again. Mm -hmm. And if it does become imbalanced, now the food source uh, for microbiology in that soil is 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 depleted and microbiology starts to go very slow and sluggish. Mm -hmm. And we start to grow in turf, we start to grow a very healthy crop of thatch. Uh, and it's very uh, prevalent, especially when we're trying to grow in new golf courses, new sports fields. Uh, we're putting a lot of nitrogen, get the grass growing, get the grass growing. And we're growing grass, but we're also slowing down biology because of the carbon uh, to nitrogen ratio. And we're growing this beautiful crop of very hard to manage thatch, which is lignus, long chain, undigestible carbons. And my analogy that I always use is it's like you and me chewing on pencils. And I, I heard this again not long ago from an academic saying, oh, there's plenty of carbon in the soil. You don't have to worry about carbon. This is all hocus pocus. Just put down nitrogen. And I think most people that have really gone through this experience and have been growing grass for any length of time know um, uh, that you know if we overapply nitrogen, we're really hurting ourselves, and the forms are tough, and and what it does to biology is tough. What it does to the physical structure of the soil is tough. Um, that's my dissertation, and like I said, this, <laughs> this is your show, so talk to me of nitrogen. And, okay, and Lawrence I don't, head. I don't have to mention the fact that it all ends up in the ocean. Well, don't do that. <laughs> and wells, and. Uh, what most people don't realize about high nitrogen application is that it brings on disease. Yeah. It, it shuts down a lot of defense mechanisms in plants because the plants are going, oh, I got lots of nitrogen here. I don't have to work as hard, you know, and I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I don't have to produce secondary metabolites anymore. I got all I need. And then the nitrogen goes away almost instantly, by the way, probably with, within hours of being applied. And it's like, now what? They're caught off guard. And this brings on huge disease pressures, and then you got to get out the ides. And if you want to cut down on pesticides, that would be a great place to start. Yeah. Just cut down on your, on your nitrogen. So in natural soil systems, there, there's hardly any nitrates in natural soil systems. They barely exist in natural soil systems. In natural soil systems, the ammonium, which is positively charged, tends to attach to organic matter and clays. It, it's got a positive charge, so it's going to be attracted to the negative charges on, on various minerals, organic matter, and clays. So it, it knows its place. And then when I look at products that are being applied in turf, they got an awful lot of nitrate in them. They go, holy cow, what are they thinking? Then the next product has an awful lot of ammonium in it. So it's not, not only are they overapplying nitrogen, but they're applying incredibly out of balance nitrate to ammonium ratios, which you can calculate in soil systems. I've done it, I've got these ratios in a database. So I try to formulate as a balanced nitrate and ammonium product, not a high nitrogen product with 
an imbalance yeah. of nitrates and ammonia. We just spent the last day, uh, well, you spent the last day spinning my head and keeping that balance in some of the things that we've been doing. But, you know, let's talk about nitrification uh, cycle. So you, you start with a molecule, urea. I'll use that as the example. Mm -hmm. It has to break down from a molecule to a plant usable form. The plant usable form is a nitrate. So, you know, so we go from ammonia to a, uh, to a, excuse me, from a urea molecule to an ammonia molecule, NH4, which is fairly volatile, right? It'll leach out, it'll volatilize out. We lose a lot of that. And now with the price of nitrogen, losing that molecule is, is, uh, is costly. I mean, how do we keep that volatilization down? And I think I know what you're about to say. <laughs> well, I'm very cautious how much urea I put in a product because, it, again, it's been over. That's an blood. example, but yeah. Yeah, it's highly uh, volatile. Yeah, yeah, it volatilizes like crazy. It's very unstable and not a very stable material at all. But yet it's in our urine. You know, it's like, yeah. okay, it's got to be well, Thank you for right? sharing that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we go I, I will try to balance urea against nitrate and yeah, ammonia, yeah. but try to stabilize with either a fulvic material or a humic acids material. That's the best way to stabilize it. To keep it from volatilizing, so, so yeah, there's a balance right. there. And ultimately what we're really trying what to I'm do... What I'm doing is I'm shortcutting the association to organic matter that could be done naturally, right. but you end up working on soils and turfs that are very, very low in organic matter. Right. So we got to put something in the formula to help this stuff uh, be stabilized. So I show this model, you know, urea, ammonium, nitrite, NO2, oh, which ice. is very stable. Yeah. And then we move to the nitrate, which is the form that the plant takes up. One of the questions I get often is then, then why don't we just use a nitrate form of nitrogen? Wouldn't that be what the plant wants to the take up? The plant wants both. Now they may have a preference for one over the other, but that's up to them, not us. Yeah. I mean, th they'll figure out how to extract a nitrate out of the soil if that's their preference they'll figure and in cooperation with microbes they will balance themselves and they will take care of themselves and, and I, I'm a strong believer in giving them both let them choose and there's no correlation between how much you put on a soil and what the plant takes right. up <laughs> and what drives that what mobilizes that nutrient that not nitrogen in the soil Soil life. Let yeah. me guess. Yeah. Is, is that the model of mantra of, of today? Yeah. Um, life. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and again, you know, I think the really overriding uh, conversation that I wanted to, you know, put on tape here is that life is what this is all about, biological soil management. And yes, it is incredibly important to reduce these inputs because we do overuse them. And, and now more than ever, uh, with the price of nitrogen as, as it's uh, been found in the last, you know, nine months and... Hopefully we'll stabilize a little bit, but but improving soil biology. I talk to lawn care operators, and these are these are business owners that you know their livelihood is now uh, based on, and their profitability and their ability to pay their bills at home is based on how much input goes in, and they're all, all really fighting to find ways to reduce inputs. And we have conversations about getting life into the soil so that you know they can more efficiently get nitrogen from that molecule into a plant usable form because all of those steps are about microbes and if you burn out all the carbon you know uh, this is the old chemlon model they knew that if they pound the soil with nitrogen they're going to literally the carbon to nitrogen is going to be imbalanced because you put down that pound of of carbon and and, and I, it's funny i talked to a former student of mine and i used to use the phrase meat and potatoes and and i've had a number of students come in and those of you that uh, listen to me uh, and all, were former students, meat and potatoes was the common, and that was carbon to nitrogen. Nitrogen being the meat, you know, the potatoes being the carbon. Uh, you know, you need to have a balance of both so that you have energy, the carbon, to break down the meat, the proteins of the plant, the body can use it, and that's what, the, you know, meat and potatoes means. By overeating meat, you're burning out all the carbohydrates and uh, or putting down too much nitrogen, you're burning up all the carbon in the soil, so now you're losing all the microbial food. And it goes back to being able to keep life in the soil. And that's my statement for the day, and I'm leaving it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought of something when you apply high nitrogen inputs to plants. Uh, it does something to the microbiology so, they, so the plants are unable to take up sufficient quantities of silicic acid 
not silicon dioxide that I see on labels, but silicic acid is, is actually released by plant root systems and microbes. And that silicon, form of silicon, is brought up into plants and they need it for phosphorus utilization, detoxifying things, and general plant health improves in the presence of silicon. High nitrogen shuts down that, Everything. that, that ability to yeah. take up silicon. Yeah. yeah, it's really sad. Well, it is after five o'clock our time and, and uh, cocktail hour is coming upon us quickly and, uh, and then I get to get rid of you. I mean, then, then you get to move on to your next uh, journey, but I wanna thank you for all the time today and yesterday and for this uh, uh, life stimulating conversation <laughs> and uh, for all the support you do. And uh, thanks for coming to, uh, to my lovely little office here and sitting in front of my uh, computer and talking. You're any, welcome. Any last thoughts on, on life? <laughs> there you go. We will be back again next week with another Earthworks podcast. Probably not live and de most definitely not with Mr. Mayhew. But, uh, but thank you again for being with us. And if you're not a, a subscriber to the Earthworks podcast, subscribe. You get the notifications from who's going to be on next. And, and uh, you know we've been getting uh, great uh, feedback from the podcast. So uh, please, uh, please be a subscriber and uh, follow us next week on another Earthworks podcast. Thank you, Lawrence. Bye. <laughs>